Hola! Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host Agostino. This is episode number 132. <laughs> 132. Uno, tres, dos. Episodio. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys are doing fine. I'm doing absolutely amazing. I'm absolutely. I'm actually. I'm. I'm doing okay. I'm could be better. I'm caffeine less because I'm um, like an idiot. I forgot to go buy some uh, coffee beans so I could grind them up and then put them into my instant coffee maker. So I'm currently sipping on the old PG tips. And in order to get my uh, caffeine kind of hit, I've uh, left the tea bag in there whilst I'm drinking it in order for it to soak. So I can get as much as I can of the concentrate from the tea bag, which is, you know, a little bit of a dumb tactic, but you got to get your hits, so you got to get your hits. So I'm thinking now on the way out, I might go and head off to uh, Pret-a-Manger and get myself a little bit of filter coffee to give myself a little pep. It's a little bit like drinking hospital coffee, but a little bit better than that. And usually it's too hot to sip straight away, so you have to kind of let it cool down, which kind of, you know, takes away the whole point of having hot coffee. But I need my hit. I need my hit, man. I need my hit. I wouldn't say I'm addicted to it, but I'd say it's part of my um, daily routine. Um, when I wake up in the morning and the sun hits my eyes. No, no. <laughs> when I wake up in the morning, um, b- before I... Uh, no, I will, after one, well, as soon as I come back from the gym, I'll get my breakfast ready. The first thing I do is kind of, you know, get the coffee on. Usually it's pretty good in the morning because um, the brunette has probably woke up before me or I've woke up in the morning before her. So I probably put on coffee and then head out to the gym. By the time I come back, it's already warm. Uh, but today wasn't one of those days, so I'm going to have to go and get it from the old coffee shop, unfortunately. But hey-ho, I'm not going to cry over spilt milk or cry over spilt coffee, get it? <laughs> Stupid boy like me. Anyway, 132 episode. I'm nice, fresh, and back from the gym. Um, I feel fucking smashed. I did this new word that I haven't done in a while. Well, I haven't done it ever, actually. I did a word where it's uh, it's for time. So it's basically, um, you have to do as many rounds as you can. So I did five rounds of 20 kettlebell swings with 40 flutter kicks. And if you're not familiar with flutter kicks, are, it's the thing that you used to do. I remember I used to do it a lot when I played Sunday League football. Uh, it's that thing where you lie down on the ground and you kind of raise your feet. Um, you, lie down on a, you lie down on your back and you raise your heels up uh, about five inches from the floor. And you point your feet fo- um, towards, you know, forward, basically. And you kind of do flutter kicks. So like up and down, up and down, down really quickly. Um, and I did 40 of those. So I did five, uh, 20 kettlebell swings and 40 flutter kicks for five rounds. Absolutely smashed me, man. Absolutely smashed me. Um, that combination of doing kettlebell swings, the up and the down, and then getting down and doing flutter kicks really, really smashed my abdomen. But I'm hoping that it's going to allow me to have a flipping ripped abdomen by the by the new year. It's, it is, I don't know. I, I'm trying to wrap things up a little bit before the new year starts as well. I don't, I'm not a big believer in New Year's resolutions in general. I think, you know, you just, it's, there's, those things are like uh, primed to, to fail, really. You know, when you when you make such a big deal out of writing these long list of goals, and usually they're not very specific as well. That's the thing I've learned about goal setting. It's not necessarily that goal setting is wrong or goal setting is bad. More, the, the main thing that people don't end up doing, they don't end up getting specific enough exactly what is the goal that they're trying to achieve. And actually setting some, um, you know, some uh, realistic uh, measurements of time that it might need for you to kind of achieve that goal and not thinking that you're going to need a whole year in order to kind of lose a couple of stone. That's a little bit too much time. You can probably set up little um, ro- little kind of rope, little, um, what are they called? Not roadblocks. Little uh, milestones, you know, like um, within like, I don't know, let's say within two weeks, you want to see this change in your eating habits. Within four weeks, you want to see this change within your endurance capability, blah, 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 blah. That's a much better way to set up some hobbies. I mean, set up some um, goals. But overall for me, I find it a lot easier to just start now uh, in December whilst, uh, you know, whilst I'm kind of in my best kind of spirits and kind of go from there really and see what lands afterwards on the other side. But apart from that, um, training hard, working out, the gym's absolutely empty, which has been an absolute blessing. Absolute blessing. Well, especially when you go in the morning, because I try to go to the gym before 8 a.m. So I try and go between the hours of 6 and 7. I think once the kind of the darkness starts to ramp up a little bit, I'm going to start going a little bit earlier in the morning. I want to start doing a lot more 5 a.m.s for just a week, just to kind of see how that feels. Um, 
But in general, it's amazing going to a gym at seven in the morning or seven, eight in the morning because no one's there. Everyone's kind of like at home or everyone's gone to work or everyone's, I don't know, whatever else they're doing. So it's always quite cool to kind of go there because the absolute gym is all free. Like when I went to the free weights area to go do my bench press and deadlifts and all that other shit, it was absolutely empty. There was absolutely no one there. I was in the bench, I was in the free weights area on by myself. And usually if you know any sort of like council gym or any gym in general, the bench press and the squat machine are always, 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 always occupied. There's always somebody there doing some sort of nonsense. There's always some, um, and whenever I go again, I, I try not to be judgmental of people, but there's always people just taking taking absolute ages doing stuff. You know, like I'm 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 so militant with my workouts. I just try and go in out in out quick as possible. Um, and also, I'm I'm big believer in it's not like how long you're in there. It's it's what intensity you're doing those workouts that you're doing whilst you're in there. So what I try to do is I try to like get my songs or music that I want to listen to set up before I even um, walk into the gym doors. I get it all set up. Usually well, at the moment what I'm doing now, if I had a new album I want to listen to, or usually if I'm kind of in a bit stuck in a rut and I don't know what to listen to, I'll just whack on Playboy Carti, um latest album, Die Lit, which has been my kind of go-to gym workout music, and just and just hit it on shuffle and let, and let it run through. Or and other times I'll just go to my song list on iTunes and just like, um, play all my songs and shuffle down on iTunes, and I usually, and usually for me anyway, that's been a, a much better way to do things as opposed to just you know, I'm standing on my phone, letting it trying to connect onto Wi-Fi, then trying to find the right playlist, and I don't like that one, then I want to listen to that one, then log into my Spotify. It's all an absolute madness. So I don't do that at all, and I don't use my phone when I'm in the gym. When I'm in the gym, no phone zone. The only time I use my phone is to um, uh, put on the stopwatch. Because I quite like the stopwatch on the iPhone. It's really nice, um, nice, bright and clear. I'll just change the settings to um, auto lock never, and then have the the light really bright, and then kind of have my stopwatch on so I can do my workouts if I'm doing like a a word, or, or even general if I'm just doing some like presses and cleans. It's good just to kind of know how long I've kind of spent doing it. But apart from that, no phone. So I'm not sitting on the bench press on my phone. And again, you don't want to be that guy that's gonna go to somebody because I know I know that person's super. Not I've seen that person in the gym, the one that's always trying to like tell you how to conduct yourself, right? Don't drop the weights. Do that. Do this. It's annoying, isn't it? Because at the end of the day, you're not there for that long. Like people that say, "Don't drop the weights." I, I don't drop weights anyway. But people that get annoyed or people making noises in the gym, it's like you're not going to be there for that long. Just get your workout over, over and done with, and just go home. You know what I mean? Like trying to conduct, trying to kind of orchestrate the 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 area that you're in within in a gym is fucking is 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 fool's errand really. Considering how many people are coming in and out of that gym, it's freaking ridiculous. And you're working yourself up over absolutely nothing. So I try not to be that dude, but you know, there's always somebody just on the bench press, uh, sitting down on their phone, scanning something. I don't know what the fuck they're doing. I don't know if they're on social media. I don't know if they're just like um, changing the song or on this. I don't know what they're doing, but whatever it is, get off the fucking machine. Sometimes I have done like the whole, like, you know, walk past them a couple of times, stand there, uh, make them feel uncomfortable. And then they look up and, oh, you want to use it? Do you know what I mean? Because usually they just, they don't know what they're doing. Usually they just come to the gym to just, you know, um, uh, try and just, gone or you know play it by ear which i never understood really i know it's a bit it's a bit i have a bit of a cheat code because i just log on to the crossfit website and just do my boycotts on there but you know at the moment i'm using a crossfit invictus invictus yeah invictus it's got the the workouts uh broken up into i think a competitor like if you want to do if you want to enter the crossfit games it's kind of got that workout for you they've got a fitness um one that i do for running and they've also got one for strength so you they just break them down by day they've got the first portion which is kind of like a skills bit um, so you're going to do maybe some barbell rows, you might do some pull-ups, you might do some um, calisthenic sort of work, and in the second half of the workout, you do the word that's kind of where you kind of push yourself to your um, um, aerobic, capa- aerobic kind of capacity, so I can see how far you can stretch that shit. But yeah, um, I try to be in and out, man. Some people are not in and out guys, some people like to just hang around and chill. I never really got that, but again, I think I've, I've, I've theorized that the person that likes to hang around in the gym and just sit on machines and shit and take up space is the same kind of person that likes to hang out in the toilets. This sounds weird, right? Or hang out in, at, in the toilet at, in their own home, you know, not, not public toilets and shit. But my little brothers, when I used to live at home, did this so much. It used to fucking annoy me. No ends, right? Because I would always like try and go and have a shower, whatever it may, and it always fucking be in there. It used to really piss me off, but they like to just hang out in the shower. Just to like, you know, just chill out. I don't know if they're taking a shit, just hang out, be on their phone. I don't know, read a book. Just, I don't know, look at themselves in the mirror for 35 minutes. There's people out there that like doing that. Just like, you know, just because I guess the, the toilet or or the, your shower room is sort of like, um it's a bit of a hallowed space. No one's really going to um disrupt you there. Like whenever someone, oh, where's so-and-so? They're in the toilet. You just leave them. Do you know what I mean, you don't go up and check or knock the door and tell them to hurry up. You just kind of let them do their thing. 
So I think maybe toilet people. Oh, my side, my got some eggs stuck there. Ugh, lucky. I've been telling people before we see that as like the one place where you're gonna get absolute peace and quiet. But for me, but I hate that they, that kind of uh, translates itself into the gym as well. But hey, what can you do? I, mean, I don't want to be that guy that's going to start complaining about stuff. That doesn't make any sort of sense. Anyway, apart from that, now I've got that nice egg out of my mouth. Um, let's roll on to some topics. Yesterday's been an absolute interesting day, isn't it? Right? I go to sleep, I wake up, and the whole fucking um, Twitter um, timeline is full of uh, Kanye West retweets and funny little memes. Absolutely hilarious. So I go to bed. And at a reasonable time, I'm currently reading uh, Who Who Rules the World by Noam Chomsky and The Flash Boys by Michael Lewis. So I've kind of got those on my mind. Go to sleep, a nice hour, wake up, go to the gym because I don't check just a movie before I go to anything. I'm just going to go straight out. Come back and I check my stream, my fucking feed, and it's full of Kanye West stuff. So supposedly, not supposedly, but Kanye West um, had a bit of a meltdown on Twitter the other day, which is nothing, you know, no surprise really for anyone has seen the things that he's kind of uh, been up to this year. It's kind of been, it's been a weird year for Kanye, hasn't it? It's been, it's been on one end, it's been a quite uh, prosperous year. You know, it seems like he's got Yeezy, um, his um, clothing company, um, where it wa- he's got it where it wants it to be, right? Um, if you believe the reports, that's a billion dollar company. If you've seen how, um, how in general, like Easy Supply is like an incredibly slick website, uh, the drops have been quite frequent. Um, he's been he kind of he kind of uh, fulfilled the promise of making sure that he makes enough Yeezys for everyone to wear around the world. Um, you can pick up Yeezy 350s, you know, uh, without any sort of hassle online, which wasn't something that happened a few uh, years ago when they first launched. And everything's kind of hotting up, right? In that respect, um, um, him and Virgil have reconciled. Um, he 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 was basically um, responsible for the resurrection of Kid Cudi with Kid C Ghost. He was responsible for crafting probably one of the best um, uh, quintessential rap albums of this year um, in Doteno with Pusha T. And, you know, um, even though the Tiana Taylor rollout didn't work out the way that she would have liked and for the fans in general, we didn't get as much music as we wanted. He was also able to kind of contribute to that project and kind of um, be able to fulfill that promise in order to kind of get her project out on that side. So in, in some ways, it's been a quite fulfilled, fulfilled year for him and plus the, the birth of his child. Like it's been an absolutely great year. But on the other end, um, musically, he's kind of suffered um, his political well, music suffered because, you know, no one really talks about yay. For the most part, uh, Saint Pablo kind of has been and gone. Uh, Yay kind of went without causing any sort of, um, um, without kind of really causing any sort of shift in culture. Usually, with, with Kanye West albums, even if you like them or you don't, they always have a tendency to kind of shift the culture, change the conversation. But that didn't happen with his own album. Um, if anything, the best thing he's done is Kid See Ghost, which is a con- which is a collaborative album with Kid Cudi, or you could say it's a Kid Cudi album featuring Creature and Kanye West. And the best work he done with Pusha T, which was uh, Daytona, which Pusha T mentioned in a few interviews, was um, primarily due to the fact that he was on top of Kanye the entire time the album was 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 getting crafted. He didn't just disappear and come back and hope it was done. He was on top of him the whole time. So the reason why it sounds the way it does, and obviously his political stances haven't really enamored him to um, the the hip hop community on the whole. And then um, the other subject of it is the continued drama with Drake, which has been, you know, weird to see because we don't really know what the truth is. We don't know whether or not it's the fact that, you know, um, supposedly um, that Scoopity Poop tune was meant to be given to Drake and supposedly Kanye West then finagled on that promise and released that parody of a song, which then Drake saw as a this, which came at the same time that uh, Pucci revealed his child was there. Blah, 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 blah. More gossip than I can handle in my own little head. But the interesting subtext to it which I think has been something that hasn't been said too often, is, um, which anyway, let's kind of go back in, in chronological order and see exactly what kind of ticked off uh, Mr. Kanye West. And the first thing that ticked him off that we see was supposedly he got a text message, it seems like, from a guy called Free, who I'm assuming is someone that's, that's um, part of good music or is part of Def Jam or something along those lines, all right? So he's texting Kanye to let him know that supposedly someone on Drake's side is trying to uh, clear the sample for say what's is it say say what's real i think it's say what's real let me quickly check it out uh where is it 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 let me get this up here so i can see so here we go um so this tweet right is um a tweet from kanye west and he tweeted out this proves shit's faker than wrestling right 
So, <laughs> which is funny considering how much he's contributed to the whole drama. But he gets a text message from this guy called Free saying, Drake sent in a clearance request for Say What's Real. Do you want to clear? Now, um, the, the, the backstory to this is supposedly that there's a 10th anniversary of uh, So Far Gone, right? Um, Drake's kind of seminal mixtape. Some might argue his best body of work that he's put together. And um, a lot's been kind of rumoured from the Drake subreddit I've seen that supposedly the 10th anniversary collection is going to be put together. That might include some vinyl. That might include a special 10th anniversary tour. That might include some special new features, a remastered version. We don't know, but it's, it's general. They're trying to kind of reissue that, um, the whole thing. Because I think they've got they've got. So far, was they got so far, so far gone on Spotify now and on iTunes, but it's not the full twenty track which I've got, which was released back in the day. Um, it's the full twenty track version of it. I don't think they've got that. I think they've got a sort of condensed version without probably the sample tracks on there. So um, they're trying to release that again. I would assume, um, of course, tenth anniversary and some extra coin in it in uh, the camp of OVO. And um, I guess if you're Kanye West and you've got ongoing beef, this is probably something that. Is a is a bigger topic. If you've got beef with somebody, but they still have your like, I don't know. If you had an argument, if you if I if I lent some Bluetooth speakers to my friend, but me and my friend fell out, or he let me his Bluetooth, can I ask for them back? Or do I just like you know? Or is that it? Is that it? am I am I am I speakers is done? I'm not too sure. Some people probably argue that if it's yours, you get it back. Some people probably argue that if that person asks you through another through a third party, you should give it back. But I don't necessarily think that proves anything. But I think in in general, I guess in the music industry, clearing samples is kind of like um, I guess in 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 musical terms, it's a way of you kind of acknowledging uh mutual respect between artists. Like you might not work together. Right, you might not want to collab with the person, but you respect what they do and you clear the sample. I'm assuming that's what kind of that like is what goes on there. So um when people do clear sample, it's sort of like a nod, okay, yeah, me and you are cool. It's like a weird way of saying you're cool, even though you're not even though there's no evidence to show you're cool from the outside in because you haven't worked together, all that sort of shit. So I guess um for in Kanye's end, he's like, What the fuck? Like I don't even I don't even talk I don't we don't talk to each other or you don't talk to me, and now you want me to clear your sample. Like, go fuck yourself, right? Go spin on this, which is you know, which is clearly which is um more than more than um which he has a kind of, you know, he has he's justified in, t in doing so. And if you're and if you're Drake, I guess it's not necessarily you that's kind of reaching out to Kanye, right? It's your team that's kind of trying to put, trying to make sure all the samples are clear. We saw what happened with Juice World and Sting, right? They were going around um, touring or performing the song "Lucid Dreams" without uh, clearing a sample, and of course, uh, Sting decided to hit them, hit them where it hurts, <laughs> and pocketed most, if not all, the royalties on on that song. Luckily for Juice World. He's like a super talented um, artist who's able to kind of, you know, bounce back and make uh, another hit after that. But for the producer that made that song, you know, he's suffering because that might be his only hit. That might be his only chance to kind of blow, to kind of get some exposure. And now the song's kind of dead. Um, so I kind of I kind of get Drake's end of that regard. You know, you've you got to cover your bases. So it kind of escalates from there. Uh, Kanye is wiling out. What's he saying here? Uh... And then this tweet is kind of hit funny. <laughs> he says, oh, I still know this is, I still need to see, uh, let me see, show her. Now, still need that apology for mentioning 350s and trying to take food out of your kids' mouths, out of your idol's kids' mouths, which is fucking crazy, right? I think Kanye's got like, Kanye's underrated in terms of um, how mean he can be, right? Because he said so many things in that kind of uh, tweet. Right, he's mentioned that he needs an apology for you know. I think it's on No Stylist. Drake says, "Uh, uh, but girl, don't wear the fifties around me." And then in the same sentence, he's mentioning you're trying to take kid food out of, my, out of your idol's kid's mouth, which is insane, right? But you know, we all know the kind of respect Drake had for Kanye as an artist. But um, I guess when that kind of track came out, I think we all knew that the kind of you know the feud hadn't stopped. They still are not on good terms. But I guess. If you are Kanye, there is a there is a there is a, a an aspect towards this where you kind of do feel like Drake's trying to cancel you, right? Because I guess they've got a personal feud, which I, I, which I think, from what it seems like as I'm looking in, it seems if Kanye West doesn't mind them having a personal feud, he just is ob objecting to the fact that he's being painted as um as a snake, right? Because he just want to leak the news that he I don't know, he just want to pass on info to push a T that Drake had a. a a child in secret right and then um now kind and now drake's kind of hell-bent in kind of ending uh drake's dominance 
or Kanye's dominance in the footwear industry, right? By saying uh, checks over stripes, by mentioning that the, the girls are wearing the free fifties around me, right? He's trying to really pummel Adidas down into the ground, which, which in you know, which um, in proxy or by association, by default, will then kill Pusher, will then kill uh, Kanye. Um, interesting tactic in general. I think if you're Kanye, you will be a bit upset if you hear that song, especially if it's the most played song around and French Montana is kind of retweeting it every four or five minutes. And I think him and Kanye are meant to be friends. It's just a strange thing. And I think it lends a lot of credence to what Pusha T said in his Joe Budden interview where he was kind of like, you know, ranting and raving or trying, just speaking very passionately about how he's a soldier, right? Like he's the, like, if someone's attacking Kanye, he's going to come out regardless and all guns blazing and attack that person because he's loyal to Kanye West. And he doesn't really understand how some other people within a camp are able to work with uh, Kanye's enemy, quote unquote, in Drake, and still be cool with Kanye. He doesn't get how that relationship happens. He says that's not something that he will do, and he doesn't. He, he doesn't, but he doesn't understand how they will do that. But he's not trying to like you know uh, speak for their actions. And it then goes. Then if you extrapolate that a little bit and you look a bit further out, you you see French Montana, who's like the friend of everyone. So you maybe can kind of discount him because he's like you know. He's like the most uh, sociable person in hip hop, and no one can really say he's, he's anyone's best friend in that regard, right? Um, he doesn't really have any loyalties to anyone apart from maybe his own little camp. But then you look at someone like Travis Scott, who's kind of got you know one of his biggest tracks in sicko mode, and you think to yourself, if you're Kanye and Travis allows Drake to jump on sicko mode and I don't know, quote unquote, sneak this him, and that song is ringing out, uh, it's playing everywhere. It's one of the you know one I think it's maybe number two in the Billboard charts or something, or number one now maybe. Uh, uh, at the last time I'm speaking, you're gonna be you're gonna be a little bit put off, aren't you? If Travis, your you know, your quote unquote brother, is he a brother in law? I don't know what that means. If you're if you both got dates, so whatever it is, right? You're 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 from the same family, and he's you know he's he's festively got one of his biggest rivals on a track sneak this in you, and then if you extrapolate yourself further from the situation, you look out a bit nerdier, you would have seen that prior to Travis Scott album coming out, there was a loads of tweets that he put out he doesn't he's not really that kind of dude where he it seemed like he was throwing shade at Kanye he said he was kind of like you know saying some things that could have been contruded as like some things of like so, oh, don't idolize your idols not everyone's as they seem blah, blah 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 and this was during the time when Kanye was kind of wilding out of his kind of pro-Trump uh, stuff so there could be something around that it could be something around that. I'm not too sure if that's actually true but it could be something in it that now we know that the rumors of Travis uh not really fucking with Kanye might be true there might be some truth to it if we kind of extrapolate a little bit. If you kind of link those tweets that he spent, he kind of tweeted ages ago, and if you kind of see what's kind of transpired so far, if you link what Pusha T said about, he doesn't understand how some people from the camp can be working with Drake whilst the beef is still ongoing. Hmm, doesn't seem too great, does it? So this kind of continued, it kind of rumbled on and on and on and on and on. I don't really want to go through every single fucking tweet on here, but the thing that kind of made me laugh and uh, really got me... Uh, going was that Kanye said he was going to buy the first two rows in Pusha T's uh, thing and then um, these series of tweets really kind of made me laugh right so you got this and this <laughs> so after kind of like baiting um, put Drake in public right um, with these tweets he's been pretty quiet hasn't he Kanye he's been kind of under the radar and I think maybe he was kind of a bit annoyed that he wasn't being discussed in the conversation about best album all this sort of stuff so he just kind of had to come out and say something right Kanye just couldn't keep his fucking mouth shut so he was kind of bored and then of course he got the perfect ammunition in free sending him this text that supposedly uh, Kanye's trying to get something cleared and then we get this amazing 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 tweet right that comes out so let me let me just see this here show screen so the first one that really makes me funny right is this one <gasps> drake finally no no so here it goes but no drake finally called right then it goes mission accomplished <laughs> so if anything you could you could just taking that isolating that tweet it could be argued that maybe he was just trolling maybe he was just that desperate to get in the conversation with drake that he fabricated a text from free in order to kind of drake, get drake to reach out and then of course because i thought when i saw that tweet i was like there's no way in hell that conversation is going to go the way Kanye wants it to go there's no way drake's going to come on that phone and start being humble if if at all drake did call i don't we don't even know if he did call we don't know if it's just a figment of Kanye's imagination or if he's just or if he took somebody else from the team, we don't know what happened. But if that did happen, I'm pretty sure Drake would be on the phone talking all kind of madness, right? Because from what he said, and if you see what kind, if you see what Drake's 
how Drake was talking about Kanye and the LeBron James barbershop thing. There is genuine, genuine, genuine dislike for Kanye now. Like what he's kind of like turned himself into. It's stuff to do with behind the scenes, stuff that we're not probably privy to. But it looks like they re like Drake really doesn't like Kanye anymore, right? As a human being. And then if you extrapolate a bit further, you see that Don C and all those guys and Virgil are kind of hanging around with, with, with uh, Drake more and they've kind of distanced themselves from Kanye. They do talk about him in interviews and stuff, but for the most part, they don't really mention him. Don C hasn't said anything about Kanye since Don and Kanye kind of went like, crying on that Chicago radio show about he hasn't got his friends around him. It seems as if like there is some genuine dislike of Kanye within his closest circle, within those people that kind of are his friends, right? So you can kind of imagine that phone call with Drake isn't going to go the way Kanye would want it to go in terms of like, oh, Drake kind of like, you know, bowing uh, to at his feet and sort of like uh, essentially kissing the ring. And then, and then, um, so that, may, that makes you think that maybe Kanye was trolling the whole way through. And then the final tweet, which kind of, um, kind of summarizes that whole occasion was this one that says, uh, by the way not cleared right so that effectively you know exactly what's happening there right so that it's just he is effectively trolling right so he, he didn't get the the response he wanted i'm sure drake was talking all sort of like wild mess on the phone and then kanye was like you know what fuck you i'm not clearing and again like i said to you previously i think that is the music industry's way of uh, um uh, if you clear a sample, especially if your person's not paying for the sample, it's a way of like saying we're cool. No worries. Do you know what I mean, I respect what you're doing. I respect the 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 the, the, um, the artistry. Maybe you might take a little bit off the back end, but for the most part, you're not trying to take fifty fifty or the whole track or the whole royalties like a uh, Sting did with uh, Juice World. And then um, to make matters even more interesting, right? Because if you know, you know, the, these things are even, it's always nice to kind of capitalize on a little bit of internet drama and kind of get involved in the muck without, you know, without kind of st uh, staining yourself. I decided, Agostino, this kind of brave creative soul out here, I decided it was a good idea to uh, create some merch that would kind of, you know, uh, resonate with the Kanye West crew. <laughs> so I decided to put together this quick little piece of merch that's available now on, um, on Big Cartel, if you go to Twitter Meltdown, all one word, Twitter Meltdown.BigCartel.com, you can get yourself a bit of Kanye merch, um, a bit of, uh, by the way, not cleared merch, available now for £20. <laughs> I thought, why not, man? It's such a funny occasion to do. I thought, why not whack this up quickly and chuck this on the interwebs? There we have it. There we go. Um, you can check that out. I'll, I'll put a link available in the show description and in the audio link for you guys to check out as well. But it's available right now on Big Cartel. Get yourself some not cleared merch just for the lols, only for the lols. Um, and again, um, the tweets transpire again. It goes on and on and on. Kind of mentions, kind of mentions that's a, that um mentions the the kid that went to the Pusha T concert in Toronto and got fucking smashed to smithereens by security and Pusha's team. Supposedly that kid's on life support. Um, which is fucking nuts. I didn't know that. I don't again. I don't know if this is true. This is all kind of Kanye's mouth. Kanye insinuates that Drake was a guy. Drake was the one that got that kid um, to got that kid to, to go there and try to assault uh, push to the concert, which is fucking ridiculous. Really, someone of Drake's ilk is not gonna go and send some spotty teenagers to go and you know fight his battles. That doesn't make any sort of sense. But again, the the war is getting messy. The war is getting messy. And if it didn't, and if it wasn't getting any messy enough, you know, it's kind of going on and on and on. What kind of made really everyone kind of stand up and take notice was the fact that um, Kanye West's wife, Kim Kardashian, decided to kind of get her voice involved too. And she tweeted at Drake directly. They tweeted at Drake and said, at Drake, uh, here is a tweet here. Get it up there. At Drake, never threaten my husband or our family. He paved the way for there to be a Drake. Jesus Christ. So imagine... Um, the one person who this whole beef kind of start kind of this whole beef kind of got a bit messy for was kind was Kim. The whole rumors that supposedly uh, Drake was messing with her on the side whilst Kanye was going through his nonsense, which is you know a stupid fucking rumor that has probably no basis in fact whatsoever. But the fact that um, both, I mean, the fact that um, Drake's side, Drake wasn't really. Uh, willing to kind of clear that up and kind of let the rumors roll kind of you know i'm assuming didn't really go down well with kanye and for the most part kim has kind of kept her head out of it but i guess you know in the kanye in a kim kanye household you can only imagine the amount of frantic shouting that's going on around there with this thing transpiring on twitter and it's absolute mess of a situation again i think it's a it's a mess to see grown adults especially people with kids um putting out all their business on social like this it's never something that you want to do i think you want to cut yourself with a bit of class 
And I think, you know, it goes to goes to show, man, like for all the, you know, Jay, we've, we've only seen one chink in JJ's armor with that infamous lift situation, right? But for the most part, they've been able to keep um, a functional household under wraps without any kind of, without, you know, revealing the inner workings of their family, without kind of inviting the press or the media into it. Um, very, 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 very fucking well. And I think it just goes to show just how difficult it is to do. I think there is a tendency for people in the public eye just to always, always have themselves involved in some sort of public conversation just to keep them their name out there and it's just an it's just frustrating to know and to see because for all the lows and for all the things like there's kids involved there's family members involved that have nothing to do with this there's people um connected with the camp start getting involved in this that also have nothing to do with this too who are going to get affected by this uh flagrant um disregard for anyone's kind of well-being and safety overall because these little things can just fester so much that they can kind of carry they can kind of build and build and build up into a moment where something real will happen and i think the push of t uh, toronto thing is a good example yes drake was not um, directly responsible for that kid going up on stage and doing what he did but that whole energy the whole out uh, um you know the beef in general how it transpired the bad blood between them uh the fact that both fans both sets of fans are in incredibly stanish they're on the drake side and the push t side it only made sense that if that happened and if push he decided to go forward with his date in toronto that there would be a section of the crowd who would take upon themselves to kind of back their dude which is fucking cringy as fuck if you don't know who drake, if you don't know drake personally and you're going uh to a push t concert paying your hard-earned money queuing up buying a drink and then deciding to go throw it at an artist you're a fucking loser regardless but it can't you know it, it's no surprise that all that energy is going to kind of lend itself to the situation that we're in now in general everyone looks like a loser i think here kim looks like a loser Kanye looks like a loser drake looks like a loser everyone looks like losers the quicker everyone kind of goes back to concentrating on music and doing what they do best in this industry the, the better for everyone in general um and i can't wait until it's over again it's a fucking amazing end of the year i think for the memes uh by the way not cleared i think it's gonna go on and on and on and um uh kim kardashian effectively copying and pasting her husband's tweet and then <laughs> adding it to drake is fucking hilarious uh uh, the fact that that whole Jenner household um, is essentially, you know, in Drake's pocket in some regard. Eh? You know, you're seeing videos of so and so members like playing Drake songs. It just must be. It's just such a shitty, mess, shitty, uh, mess, tacky situation. I don't even know where to begin. But anyway, that's that's it for me in general. It's kind of giving me a headache speaking about it overall, and that's half an hour of my life I've wasted. Um, but yeah, anyway, um, onto some topics that are actually of use and <laughs> has some sort of substance to it. Um, let's go to my docket and see what I've got there. Uh, um, oh, update on the Gosha. So Adidas are supposedly investigating Gosha Brzezinski. I'm not going to say ooh because, you know, people's livelihoods are on the line and shit. So I take that back and ooh. But um, Gosha Brzezinski supposedly has been in, is being investigated while well, he's you know i guess the deal is being investigated on adidas's end as i'm sure you're aware allegations came out the other day supposedly that some prospective models were quote-unquote being inappropriately contacted by um gosha and being asked for lewd pictures um if you believe the internet but then gosha side um came out and kind of justified the fact that you know in order to scout these models on social media he needs to be on social he needs to be on these social media platforms um in order to kind of communicate with them and the story rumbles on you don't know who to believe really you don't know if uh, gosha just is giving is being a nasty guy you don't know if the kids are reading too much into it we don't know if the kids are being too naive and allowing themselves to be communicated by this dude who the fuck knows what's happening but what we do know is that something is gonna hit the fan so uh supposedly uh adas are now getting involved too and they're now investigating their partnership with gosha um this is an article from uh soul collector god adas says adas says it's looking into claims against gosha Brzezinski. uh adas has issued a statement um which i don't think you actually read the actual statement i, don't, I think got, so just connected them and contacted them and they've kind of relayed it back but it says here adas has issued a statement in regards to recent allegations made against russian streetwear designer and frequent collaborator an adas spokesperson has told so collector that the brand takes any allegation of, and, uh, of this nature extremely seriously and is currently looking into the claim that has been made the fair for your designer of his own label has been recently accused of sending property measure 16 year old boy so yeah um so now we know adas is getting involved so um Again, I think he shouldn't. He should be. He, he should be. Um, remain innocent until proven guilty. I think we should allow this to go through the court of law if something, or you know, go through the the um, necessary channels to kind of ascertain whether or not this is um, right or not. I don't think he should be uh, pillared. Um, 
you know, wrongfully in public just because, you know, it does come across. I know on optics wise, it does look really nasty. And I'm sure there's probably more people going to come out. There's probably more evidence that I probably haven't seen just yet. But hopefully we kind of get to the bottom of it in general. I'm not sure if the community, I'm not sure if the, if the scene will cancel Gosha anyway. Will kids stop wearing their things just because um, Ada's cut ties away? I'm not too sure if that's actually correct. I'm not sure if um, the brand will stop operating if he does get, if it, if it does come to uh, light that some, that he wasn't appropriately contacting them. I think the only way that he could be cancelled is if it transpired that he was involved in a sexual relationship with kids. I think that would just be the end of him in general. I think if, um, if it transpires that he was contacting them um, and it seemed like he was being a bit of a creepo and he wasn't necessarily, he's being very careful in the things that he said i think people would be a little bit more forgiving i again i, I feel disgusted for saying it but i'm just going by other people in the industry and what's happened because if you look at it in general from streetwear point of view i think the only person that's been cancelled right uh, fully has been aaron bondaroff no one else has been cancelled no one else has been completely or from the scene from the rumors that we've heard the things that we've seen um from the stuff that people know of in the industry no one's been cancelled apart from aaron bondaroff everyone else has kind of been allowed to kind of uh, continue doing what they're doing uh, a blight without the lime light or the spotlight on them a blank from not getting posts on, on big blogs for instance um ian connor is a good one um he's been he's been able to kind of inoculate himself from any sort of criticism or from any sort of like accusation because he's effectively made he's effectively made himself he's made, made himself an island hasn't he he's created sicko mode and he's he's got the shoes the kind of storm and revenge shoes that he's kind of put out as well and he's been able to kind of make a lot of money with those sort of products in general which hasn't necessarily allowed which hasn't necessarily needed him to kind of go to a corporation or to kind of get a cosign and for the most part he's received radio silence on blogs i don't think any blog has covered anything he's put out ever since those allegations came out so he's effectively been doing this all through his own social media platforms and um he's been kind of excommunicated from the the scene overall but it seems like virgil still fucks with him he was at the louis vuitton show um kanye still fucks with him because he sends him yeezys all the time um so for the most part he's been able to kind of um, he, he's been the one that's been able to survive accusations we don't know if they're true or not i don't know i have no idea but he's been only, he's been only one that i've seen so far i've been able to survive it just because he's allowed himself to be in a position where he's kind of effectively got fuck you money he doesn't necessarily um need um he doesn't necessarily um need permission to do anything in general in the scene so i don't know what's gonna happen with gosh i'm not sure if it might be the same sort of thing because i think he might have built up enough of a fan base that they're probably not going to care which is crazy to say because most of his fans are kids who are under fucking 21 so they probably should care but again i'm just hypothesizing because i've seen anyway the only person that has got cancelled so far has been andrew bondra but yeah adas is still <laughs> continuing investigating the issue um hopefully to get to the bottom of it and we find out exactly what's going on but again like i said previously i think for kids just be careful just be just use your street smarts um don't go into these relationships or these opportunities to kind of represent brands um head head first kind of use your head first um speak to your parents even though they don't understand the scene talk to them about where you where where this agency wants you to go to do a shoot or whatever it may be don't do things in hiding like i used to do like you know because oh they're not going to get it and then you get, get some situation that you can't get yourself out of uh just use your head use your head use your head and again let's stop with the hero worship man um these people that you hero worship you never know what they're doing behind closed doors so let's allow that next on the list what do we have here uh eugene hates fashion should I talk about that or shall I allow that? Hmm. <laughs> Actually, yeah, let's talk about this. Fuck it. So, Eugene Rabkin. Um, I made a video about him previously. He's the I'm he's the head honcho at Styles at Style Zeitgeist, a very popular kind of avant-garde uh, fashion platform and forum. Um, during the time when Super Future and Fifth Dimension Forum and a few other places were kind of dying, um, so the style site guys was still the place that a lot of people that are kind of fans of Andy Lemusta, Rick Owens, and that whole um kind of like goth ninja look was still posting fit, still posting pickups, still posting like sale notices and shit. It was kind of a thriving community, so it's sort of it sort of survived the um 
the advent of Instagram and those places because a lot of the people that were on forums are now just posting their fists directly onto Instagram or they have like kind of places they kind of uh, pages they sort of follow on there so for the most part it's sort of like made forums redundant and also the kind of uprising of uh, Facebook groups and like pages is also kind of um, relegated um, forums to the kind of never regions of the internet but for the most part Stars like has been able to reinvent itself they've now got a magazine they've got a pretty popular uh, website where they kind of post op-eds and opinion pieces and one of the most four and one of those opinion people opinionated people on their platform is the head honcho Eugene Rabkin who I've kind of always had a little bit of a love relationship with I kind of appreciate his passion I appreciate his dedication I appreciate how highly invested he is in fashion overall I appreciate his kind of honest takes on collections especially um, when he's in Paris and there's you know and there's this kind of um hype train going along for a certain designer he's always somebody that you can kind of rely on to kind of give you the actual realness of what's actually happening um I appreciate that whole malarkey but there is something about his disdain towards what fashion has become nowadays and you know it's no it's no coincidence that he starts to hate fashion just when the fashion voice the voices in fashion are changing away from the kind of conventional went to a fashion school look like a certain way speak a certain way like it's moving away from that and it's kind of um you know as uh, as i've mentioned a few times it's sort of like within this uh street where uh bubble or suddenly the street where cloud at the moment everything's kind of been influenced by brands that are taking inspiration directly from the quote-unquote streets which everyone should be doing anyway because if you take cooperation from things that are around you but it seems as if like his disdain for that kind of current trend and the people that are now being championed behind it has i don't know i won't show i'm not sure if you'd call it racial overtones i'm not sure if i would go that far to say that but there is something about his kind of criticism about it that kind of rankles me that kind of runs me out the wrong way and he recently put an op-ed out um that i don't necessarily agree with in any way part or form but i kind of wanted to share it and just kind of get it out there and see what else other people think about it so um this op-ed he put out recently on styles like guys is called how premium mediocre fashion conquered the world so um uh, you know effectively we know exactly where he's kind of going with it but let's kind of read a few bits and pieces of it and i'm going to kind of break it down from my end and say the pieces that i think i don't necessarily agree with so um can i zoom in here or not I don't think I can. Okay, anyway. So um, let's continue the article. So um, it's on Styles Like Us. I'll link it in, in the show notes so you can check it out if you're listening via audio or watching it on video. You can read along. So last year, the, the article starts. Last year, the the blogger, uh, Vin, Vinkatesh Rao, coined the term premium mediocre. He was referring to a segment of economic activity largely dreamed up by marketeers to give the masses the illusion that they are consuming luxury, when in reality where they were doing nothing of the sort. Some examples of what was proven to be a highly profitable sector, craft beer, artisanal pizza, $25 signature burgers, and my personal favorite, premium economy on domestic flights. The idea is simple. By dressing up something mediocre as premium with extra touches and real uh, the real and imagined companies play on the com- on the people's aspirational drive to give them the illusion that they are purchasing into something elevated. The marketing speak created around the premium mediocre sector terms such as uh, terms like preferred, signature, and collection. The best use uh, piled on top of each other to make, say, signature collection. Here, the paradox of providing an air of exclusivity without excluding anyone is key. And again, I, I take umbrage to this point, especially the, the point about the um, premium economy flights. I don't think anyone that's um, going on a premium economy flight is under any illusion that they're kind of getting some sort of uh, luxury treatment from fucking Ryanair. If anything, it was more so um, an incentive. It was more so an incentive to Ryanair to just make more money and to also make sure that there's not as not not as many long queues as, as there need to be, unnecessary long queues. If you go on any Ryanair flight, for the most part, the queues are insanely long. They don't, and, and they don't need to be. And there's only a certain amount of baggage space because usually most people that are going on Ryanair flights aren't checking in their baggage, right? They're going to take on carry-on luggage. So that's going to mean the baggage allowance that is available overhead is going to be all taken up. So it makes sense for the airline companies or budget airlines to make more money and to ease the queue congestions to allow people that want to be on, on a quote-unquote economy flights to buy reserve seating. That's going to cost a little bit extra. You go into a different queue to buy... um um the capabilities to bring on um hand luggage and to put it into the overhead lockers but i don't necessarily think that's a uh, somehow ever anyone in that queue i don't think anyone with any sort of sense is in that, that's in that queue is thinking that they're, they're in first class or right now that's insane first class 
luxury, a luxury in, in especially in flying, you see it when you go in first class. Like there is a clear difference in the treatment, in the things that you're able to use, like being able to carry your bag onto the plane earlier than everyone else or being able to sit before everyone else on a plane that's going to leave at the same time. It's just, it's, it's insane. So that kind of, that correlation is a bit, is a bit of a stretch. Your correlation to do with pizza is a bit of a stretch. Your correlation to do with burgers is a bit of a stretch. But again, let's go and continue and hear what else he has to say. Um, this is an old story in fashion and it wouldn't be a surprise if Starbucks and Delta executives have taken a page out of the fashion's playbook. What's relatively new is how pervasive pre premium mediocre fashion has become. Take a look around and it won't be hard for you to spot premium mediocre fashion virtually anywhere. From Unico cashmere that it doesn't feel like cashmere at all to Balenciaga baseball hats and Gucci headbands. From logo Burberry keychains to pretty much anything and uh, the fragrance kind of Bloomingdale's. This is a weird argument. So he's complaining. He's complaining that big luxury fashion brands are uh, wanting in an effort to kind of boost in a kind of in an effort to boost their sales because that's what they care about right bottom line they're not trying to create a mediocre class it's not the fact that these streetwear guys who happen to be black that are coming in and cheapening up your fucking brands it's that these luxury fashion brands are looking at their bottom line and seeing that the older clientele that was sustaining or that were kind of helping their brands stay afloat are now dying or are moving on to other things so they want to capture a young youth market and in order to capture that young youth market who don't have that much disposable income you have to allow them to to buy into their buy into your brand with uh i don't know kind of a headband with a wallet with a keychain that's where you're gonna let have some sort of brand loyalty from a kid that's like 16 you're gonna allow him to save up some money buy a keychain for 120 pounds and then the hope that when they turn 26 they're gonna come back to you for a trunk they're gonna come back to you at 45 for a pair of loafers that's what they're doing it for it's just for the bottom line it's not some sort of like um sinister um, initiative from the higher ups or from the quote unquote black people within streetwear now, or they are taking over fashion community in order to kind of cheapen the brands that you know and love. It's fucking ridiculous. Um, anyway, it continues. Um, the major purveyors of premium mediocre fashion uh, tend to be American. Uh, Michael Kors, Kate Spade, Tory Burch are superstars here. They have built highly successful business by peddling goods in the medium, in the mid hundred dollar range to the masses by marketing them in oxymoron affordable luxury. Of course, what they're selling is not luxury, but luxury does a sprinkle on top of a mediocrity. But the point of that is many people, don't, why are you talking about like, do you honestly think a girl that buys a Michael Kors bag is in un, is in any any un, is any un, any un, uh, illusion that that thing is a Celine bag? She doesn't. She knows it's not a Celine bag. She just wants to look fucking nice and have a bag that doesn't look like it came out of Primark. Has a little bit of panache Has a little bit of luxury to it. What's wrong with that? I don't see anything wrong with that at all. That that is completely fine. And it's Michael Kors. Michael Kors, Kate Spade, and Tory Burch aren't pretending to be Gucci. They're not pretending to be. It's a different kind of luxury. The times have moved on. The, the consumer is a little bit more discerning but they also want access to these brands they also want to be able to have entry-level items and these are entry-level brands um I'm, I'm i'm pretty sure people that buy into michael kors will eventually then progress up to valentino and whoever the other brands are but they need some sort of entry system into fashion this what's this um idea about keeping it walled and keeping it gate this is this is like this is this sounds like somebody who's bemoaning the demise of gatekeepers who's kind of um reluctantly tr reluctantly trying to hold on to his power not reluctantly desperately trying to hold on to his power like it's ridiculous it's gone it's gone unfortunately it's gone Anyway, that's what continues. Instead of getting wrangled myself up for no reason, Premier Luka extends to higher um, echelons of fashion as well, largely entry level uh, product range, which is fine, which is how it should be. It's entry level product range, Eugene. Premium Mediocre is the Prada nylon backpack, the Louis Vuitton bag with co with a coated canvas, the $375 Celine card holder. This segment of luxury fashion has been doing extremely well because the margins in Premium Mediocre segment are economically high. No, it's not. It's because loads of people are buying it because they want to buy into the brand. Yes, the margins are good for the business, but why it's been doing well is because people want to buy into Celine, but they might not have Celine money. They might not have enough money at the moment to buy it ready to wear pieces at that present time. So what they do buy is they buy the card holder. Is they buy a t-shirt? They buy a tote bag. They buy a scarf. That's fine. That's okay because eventually what you're hoping is that this discerning customer who's who's kind of traversed, who's kind of walked past all the fast fast all the fast fast the fast fashion stores. Is kind of left left behind Zara, left behind H and M, excluded them and saved up all their money to buy a fucking Celine scarf that isn't cheap, right? It's gonna kind of like five hundred dollars plus. 
you're hoping that in general they're going to appreciate that scarf and see wow this scarf has lasted me four years five years and it survived many washes i'm then going to then invest into a pair of trousers into into a blouse into i don't know a necklace whatever it may be that's what you're hoping is that's what the hope is when you make an entry when you make an entry level an item in your collection jesus um as far as as far as 2015 according to um euro monitor international luxury small level goods accounted for 5.7 billion in sales projected to grow to 7.5 billion in 2020 on list.com the fashion shopping aggregator plastic sandals by Givenchy and, and gucci routinely topped the most sought after product category but that makes complete sense though right if you are trying to buy into gucci and you want an entry level item a best way to do it is to go buy some slides what is the what is the annoyance here Pre-mediocre fashion is not a new phenomenon. During the 80s, Parisian couture licensed their name to mass market manufacturers, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, it continues on at the bottom here. The logo is key because in the age of Instagram, where people curate their lives in two dimensions on a small screen, the logo is more important than um, the product itself. And the best part about consuming premium mediocre today is that no one will scoff because no longer in good taste for the rich to turn their noses up at the rest of us. Democratization of fashion is trendy and provides us all with a, with a therapeutic illusion that we are somehow more equal. What the fuck are you talking about? You absolute donor. Um, of course, it's not only an illusion. All you need to do is score on medicine. Look, okay, I'm, I'm going to stop reading it because he's going to contaminate me with whatever um, hater juice he's got going running through his system at the moment. Eugene's a hater. That's basically it, man. Eugene's a hater. He, he's, he's one of the fashion... Um, he was one of the fashion gatekeepers and now he's seeing that his influence has is kind of dwindling. He's seeing the conversation within the fashion community is shifting away from his kind of artisanal uh, go to fashion school, study under um, a very storied house and then kind of reach and then kind of branch out and do your own thing. He's seen that kind of narrative is sort of kind of dying down a little bit. People are coming from various different backgrounds into the fashion industry and are taking over big houses or are, do, are, are getting really big jobs at the moment or are getting massive co signs and it's really really pissing him off um he's a little bit of a cynic um i guess he's a little bit um what's that word called embittered about where the direction of the fashion is happening where it's going at the moment and i, and I understand it i understand it being a lover of fashion i get where it is but i i would implore anyone that has that kind of thinking just to kind of look at it on the bright side and see that the democratization of fashion is amazing because it's allowing all of us that are interested in fashion to buy into it, to be able to attend a show. The democratization of fashion means that big fashion brands are live streaming their fashion, their, their fashion shows, um, their runway shows in Paris, especially the most of the, the 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 place that I kind of keep my eye on for the most part. When I was back in Canning Town reading uh, Sunday Times style magazines in the comfort of my home, desperately trying to uh, envision myself uh, taking part of in fashion, being involved in that community before I knew about all the nonsense that goes on in it but when i was dreaming about getting involved i would have loved to be able to have a live stream of a saint laurent show i'd have loved to be able to see a live stream of a, of a dior home show where Hadi Semen was there but it wasn't it wasn't something that was happening at the time because fashion had not been democratized at that moment it wasn't where it is now where it's part of the general conversation so democratization of fashion is allowing kids nowadays to be able to have access and see runway shows in their full glory for the comfort of their own home which is then inspiring them to create their own little fashion moments or their own little fashion collectives or their own little fashion communities within the industry that within the place that they live in now it's an amazing time to be a fashion enthusiast an amazing amazing time we have access to some of the biggest and best brands we have some of the best talent that are now kind of getting involved in fashion because there's so much money involved in it now that kids actually see themselves see a career um long lasting within the industry which wasn't something that would be said a few years back the the, the people that were getting paid the most were the ones that you saw in front of the uh in front of the camera screen but now the people behind the scenes are getting paid if not as much if not more than the people that are involved in that that are in the front such as the influence what it may be look what's done to the influence has allowed a whole generation of people who have been blessed with good looks blessed with good style to make money from just wearing cool outfits that's fucking amazing that's so cool research and research and development uh departments for brands are now able to kind of put out pieces and give them to or see them out to influence in order to kind of gauge what piece is going to sell what piece is not going to do well they're able to do um interesting launches in terms of pop-ups in terms of launching stuff online like some cool stuff is happening right now with fashion that is far away from the kind of cynical end if you look at from the eugene rabicon side of like oh look at all this stuff logo driven with this stuff whatever who this is amazing all brands that are all the brands that he mentioned the gucci's the louis vuitton's the celine's whatever they may be yes they have 
uh, some logo heavy pieces that are predict- uh, permanently aimed at people who want to wear things on Instagram and have it photographed and stuff. So it photographs well. That's fine. But for all the logo heavy stuff, there's still many, many pieces in fashion collections that you can get that have no excessive branding on it that you can just wear that, that are good pieces in general. And just because it has brand doesn't mean it's bad. If it has branding on it, you don't like it. Just don't buy the branded piece. I'm a big fan of Supreme. I have been since the in, since I've kind of discovered Supreme in I don't know in 2003, whenever it was when I first um, happened to stumble upon a brand. Nowadays, uh, you never see me dead in the box logo. I'm not gonna wear a, a jumper with, with uh, Supreme inscribed on the front of it or whatever. But there's still many pieces within the, within the collection that I can be a fan of and buy. But I'm not going to begrudge them for uh, catering to that market that wants to have a jacket that says Supreme on its 57,000 times. That's fine. It doesn't cheapen the brand to me. It just means that they're able to talk to different people. They're able to talk to a skater. They're able to talk to a fashionista. They're able to talk to me. That's, that's in the middle. It's the best time ever that we're, that's, that's ever existed, in my opinion. For somebody that's been locked up in the bedroom, reading through magazines, it's my only access to um, accessing the fashion community. And I have websites like Now Fashion that, that takes pictures of uh, people at the collect, uh, people at the runway shows um in and around the scene and stuff you have bloggers taking pictures you have the gq stuff you have the stuff on style.com and street style stuff you have the various um instagram profiles that sharing content you have brands um live streaming their stuff online live in the streaming and stuff on ig it's fucking amazing demarcation of fashion is the best thing that's ever ever happened and um i'd implore anyone not to be as cynical as eugene i know he's been kind of he's probably been a bit bashed and bished and smushed by the industry in general so it's become a little bit bitter but in general, I don't agree with anything he says in this article. I think he's making some stretches or some comparisons that make absolutely no sense. You know, it's just, it's a bizarre article. But I implore you to read it and make your own mind up. And um, But then, I, like I said, I think we are living in the best of times if you're a fashion enthusiast. And I only think you have to look around at the, at the brands that are heralded as some of the top ones around. Look at what they look at what they're selling. Look at the items that people are buying. Look at the people that are getting involved. Look at look at the amount of jobs that have been uh, made. Look at the people that have been put on. It's amazing. Amazing, amazing industry, man. And I fucking love it. And I won't have anything bad said about it. Anyway, um, that's an hour. I think that's a good place to end, especially me ranting and raving about fashion. Um... As always, thanks so much for tuning in. It's been amazing, as always. Um, I think this is where we, ca- like, I took my hat off. Three podcasts in a week, I think, is probably enough. My mouth is a bit dry at the moment. Uh, thanks again for tuning in. It's been amazing. It's been a good little journey. I'm going to see everyone again on, I think, next no, next week. I'll be back again for another episode of the Excellent Zinger Show. Um, before then, as always, if you want to know more information about more, my link to my website is listed below. If you want to buy yourself some uh, Kanye West merch that I've kind of nicely done down myself, you can also check that out in the show notes. I'll link that down there below so you can check that out too. It should be up on the screen now for you to see there. Twitter a meltdown if you want if you if you request someone to item to be cleared and you're not friends don't do it because you know he's gonna laugh emoji you <laughs> crying face laugh emoji whatever it's called anyway um this has been excellent zinger show episode number 132 thanks so much for tuning in it's been an absolute pleasure to have the pleasure of talking through your earlobes and communicating to you via the power of youtube and i'm going to see all of you guys again next week thanks so much for tuning in take care be easy bye